Thank you, Gary. As Gary said, I'm Ashton Bowling. I've been teaching at Auburn High School for the last five years. Previous to that, I taught at Conestoga High School, and previous to that, I taught at Omaha Bryan High School, um, where I started the first Urban Ag and Natural Resources Academy. That's where I kind of started to become interested more in sustainable practices, being in an urban uh, location um, in Omaha and having students that didn't have a typical agricultural background and trying to figure out ways that I could um, get, get those students excited about agriculture. So I carried that passion with me through um, at Conestoga where we had a school farm and now when we started at Auburn, um, it's a little bit more obviously rural than Omaha but I still have a lot of students that don't come from a farming background or don't come from an agricultural background. And so figuring out ways to get them excited about it. So I'll start off telling you a little bit about uh, my agricultural education program so you can understand um, how everything fits together. Uh, two years ago, we got a grant from the Nebraska Environmental Trust and the Nemaha Natural Resources District to put up a greenhouse. Um, so this is a picture up here of our greenhouse. Uh, with our greenhouse, we have rain collection barrels as well, and we have tower gardens. So those are the um, aeroponic tower gardens located in this picture here. Um, we have three of those. We have one in my classroom, one in our media center, and one um, that we took down to our elementary. So my students go down to the elementary and teach the students there about the plants, and they keep it in their media center as well. We just wrote a grant to get another tower garden, and that'll go in a daycare. Uh, we have an aquaponics system in my classroom. I don't have a picture of that. We worked with Whispering Roots to put in an aquaponics system with tilapia. And then here we have a native landscape that we worked with Green and Nebraska Towns to install um, all native pollinator-friendly plants there. Then uh, that's the inside of our greenhouse as well, um, where we have these hydro tables. We have electronic leaf to talk about um, water evaporation and controlling the water, the amount of water that we give our plants so we're not overwatering or underwatering. And then these tables all have a basin that fill from underneath so we can talk about the importance of putting the water on the roots rather than the water on top of the plants and it recycles through the system as well. So to complete kind of that um, process, we wrote a grant to get these garden towers. And it's kind of confusing because there's a difference between tower gardens and garden towers. Tower gardens are the ones that are um, all hydroponics. These have soil in them, so these are uh, through the Garden Tower Project. So we started looking into these. It's a nice vertical farming system, so a lot of times with my students, I try to talk about the need to grow up rather than out, especially as a lot of them don't live on farms. Um, they live in, in town or in apartments, um, and we talk about how we're losing more and more land to urban development every day that these are a way that we can grow up instead of taking up more space. Uh, they're nice because they recycle water and nutrients. The water all filters down into this basin here, um, and we can get nutrients there. It utilizes kitchen scraps in this uh, tube through the middle. There's uh, a tube that opens up, the cap opens off, and you put your kitchen scraps into there. So we started working with our school cafeteria on that. It's nice that it's mobile and has the ability to rotate. So if you were to put it, our, our greenhouse is nice because there's sun from all sides, but if you were to put it on like a porch or like a apartment, you could still rotate it to get sunlight. So the way these work is ideally you should put worms inside the tube um, by composting worms and you have um, kitchen scraps, the, the worms compost the kitchen scraps, push out a lot of the nutrients to the plants, but then we also can catch the nutrient tea down in this bottom and pull out the drawer and put it back into the system as well. So it's about seven to nine cubic feet of soil is what you need. And there's kind of about one third, one third, and one third is ideal for this type of system. Obviously light, the nice is that it does rotate to provide lighting on all sides. Obviously you need to water it, but it's good because we can recycle the water and leachate um, out through the, the, the drawer at the bottom. And then seeds, this comes with the companion seeding, seed planting guide to talk about where you should put plants and what grows best um, as well. The composting system on these towers, uh, you utilize cardboard, newspaper, leaves, and other yard waste. And you can see the interior of the tower. This is the tube that I was talking about. And here's where all the soil is. This is another picture of that tube that has holes that the worms can move in and out. 
um, depending on the type of environment they're in. You'd need approximately 250 to 500 red wigglers or uh, 25 to 50 earthworms, depending on um, how many you want. It can, it can really be pretty flexible. And about one to two handfuls of food scraps every day. Um, so kind of nice that we're teaching, I was also able to teach my students about food waste and um, the amount of food that we waste in our cafeteria every day and how we can utilize that to help compost to grow our plants. Um, when I was writing the grant, we had to think about how this would meet the three pillars of sustainability. So the first one is economically viable. The primary cost of the project is the actual farm tower. So the cost associated with this project would be minimal after the grant. There wasn't going to be a lot of money we were going to have to use after the grant was originally funded. Uh, we can sell the produce at the farmer's market or to teachers to cover the cost of the seeds and the seedlings. And the nutrients will come from the food scraps. So that was good. We didn't need to buy any extra fertilizer with it. Um, part of this stayed true. Um, we did not end up selling any of the produce. Um, we didn't have to cover the cost of the seeds and the seedlings. We were able to get um, Orschlins in, our, uh, on, in Auburn. They had a bunch of the seeds at the end of the year, and the seeds that they don't sell, they give to us now. Um, so I had a student that worked there, and he brought a, a box full of seeds in, which was really nice. Um, obviously, as seeds get old, the viability isn't as good. Um, you don't have as great germination rates, but they still work great for our greenhouse and that actually works out better because then I can talk to my students about viability and we can, um, I have seed packets from 2015, 16, 17, and 18 and so we've done germination tests to see that as well. So it ends up, didn't work great, but it ends up being a good learning tool for my students. They're ecological, ecologically sound. The system will be self-contained so it doesn't harm the, the land, air, and water. Um, it actually can serve soil and the land by using less land because we can grow up rather than out. I wouldn't have space in my greenhouse if I had to grow all of these plants growing outward. Um, erosion is nice because we can keep all that soil. We can, um, any soil that falls out, we can just put right back. Um, and we have them in the greenhouse, so we don't have to worry about wind erosion as well. In the summer, we move them out, but we can kind of block that as well. And the system has less water loss due to evaporation. The water is recycled through the system, which is good. And then finally, it's socially responsible. We can use this to teach students about growing their own food. Um, which will increase the local food movement and some of the produce will also be donated to students in need in our community. We ended up donating most of the produce either to our school cafeteria or to students in need. So our goals for this project, first of all to practice problem solving and critical thinking skills as they construct the pieces of the farm tower. So that's something that students today um, don't always have the skills to work hands-on and to problem solve. These towers come in a box just in pieces and I didn't guide my students through learning how to set these up. I said, here's the stuff, divided them into group, gave them each a tower, and they constructed the five towers on their own. It took a little bit of time, but I think that that's an important skill that we're teaching students today. Um, students were in charge of selecting plants that can be grown with the farm tower without pollination or by hand pollination. So this is a good one to just talk about pollination with my students. Right away, they, we got these, um, I think it was probably in February when we got the towers of last year, and they're like, oh, let's plant tomatoes and let's plant strawberries and let's plant peppers, knowing that these were gonna be in our greenhouse. And so at that point, it, it gave me a good opportunity to talk to my students about the importance of pollination and how we can't really pollinate because we don't have any of the bees or the pollinators in our greenhouse. So we either had to hand pollinate or find plants that didn't need pollinated. We can learn about vermiculture and the benefits of organic matter. So it gave it a, a good opportunity to talk about um, the benefits having the food waste in our system. We could observe how worms play a role in the tillage of the soil without high intensive till tillage operations and the benefits of earthworms and composting worms. Uh, we learned about raising worms and composting food scraps from the cafeteria where I said that we could learn about the food waste that we experience in our cafeteria and what we could do to help that. We planted seedlings and transplanted seedlings, so just learning the, the basics of planting seedlings, um, which to some of us, we might think that that seems second nature of how to plant a seed, but I've had many kids where we didn't have plants growing and we couldn't figure out why, and I watched them plant, and, and you know, it might say plant the seed of an eighth of an inch deep, and they were just sticking their whole finger in the soil, putting the seed in and covering up. That's something that seems second nature to some of us, but it's not to students. 
And so even that is just a small learning goal that we had. Students were able to learn to monitor plants for disease pests and deficiencies, and then simply learn how to harvest crops. It was really cool for my students to see that you didn't have to pull the whole lettuce plant out of the tower, that we could just cut it off and it would regrow itself. Um, that was something that they had never seen before either. Uh, you can see in this picture, um, this is kind of neat because we had some people come to our greenhouse sale. In our greenhouse, we also sell other uh, bedding plants, flowers, vegetable crops um, to the community. And you can see one of my students um, squatted down helping the student, um, just a, a kid that came with his mom to the greenhouse sale. He wanted a plant in the tower, so um, my student got to work with him for that. It was pretty cool. Um, as far as budgeting goes, uh, each of their towers were about $350. Um, and then we had worms, soil, water, Ziploc bags to store the produce, and rubber bag containers um, and seats. Our timeline was, we got them, so yeah, it said um, March, uh, the farm towers we ordered, seedlings we started in the greenhouse so our farm tower can begin growing produce as soon as possible. In April, we wanted to have our towers planted with lettuce, spinach, kale, and other greens is what we started with, um, just so that we didn't have to um, deal with trying to figure out hand pollination right away. Um, and those are pretty easy to grow things. Um, the spinach didn't grow great, but we had lettuce, kale, arugula, things like that growing great. And around May, um, we har wanted to start harvesting the greens in the middle of May. Uh, students were able to sample the first set of lettuce, spinach, kale, and other greens produced, and the remainder was donated to school cafeteria or families in need. This was a cool part of our project. I had kids that said, I don't, I don't eat lettuce, I don't eat vegetables, I don't eat green things. They had all the excuses in the book as to why they didn't want to try it. But as soon as they tried, I actually had a student say, oh, this actually isn't so bad. And we had the opportunity to talk then about how good produce tastes when you grow it yourself, when you have that pride in the produce. And then uh, we were able to donate a lot of it to our school cafeteria and the families in need. We wanted to donate through the backpack program, um, but the backpack program does not allow fresh produce to be um, in the backpacks. So we kind of had to find some of the students kind of on our own. Um, I would just ask students if they wanted to take home some lettuce. And that's kind of how we got around that. Um, and then in summer, we wanted to continue to grow throughout the summer, donate to families in need. Um, we could also sell it to teachers or to the farmer's market. So we haven't taken any to the farmer's market, but we have uh, sold just to teachers in our building. They've done a free will donation if they take any of the lettuce home. So that works out really good as well. Um, and then give it to the students who are tending to the tower gardens. In terms of promotion and outreach, which is a big part of the SARE grants, making sure that the message of sustainable agriculture can be um, transferred to other populations and other people. So um, we had several news articles um, that my students wrote and put into our local newspaper. Our local newspaper is really great at wanting to promote students and any of the work that students are doing. So they published a lot of our articles that we wrote. Um, we have a Facebook and a Twitter account. So um, we try to get interest um, for our program through using our, our social media outlets. Um, taking things to the Home and Garden Show is also a great way. Uh, we plan to take ours to the Home and Garden Show, and that didn't quite out work out in our schedules um, that first year. And then brochures, flyers, and posters. I had some students uh, make posters on, on sustainable agriculture, and they could uh, use our towers as the basis for those posters. Uh, we did some class debates, so I had students debate over the, the garden towers, tower gardens, um, conventionally produced food, our aquaponics system. So they researched it and really had a debate, which was good because it got them thinking about the system and which one they thought would be best for our program. And then I also um, was able to use this for curriculum and lessons as well. Um, as I said in our goals, talking about simply planting, talking about pollination, uh, talking about soil, soil structure, and how we can use worms to um, go from to go to no-till, which is nice. We had several success stories through our um, programs. So first, the Garden Tower served as a special horticulture project for Jacob Cook, one of my students. He was a student who came into my program with a little agricultural background, but he soon realized that he was really interested in plants. And unfortunately, he took plant science and horticulture before we got our greenhouse. So his plant science and horticulture class was primarily in my classroom. He didn't have a lot of that hands-on experience. So when we got our greenhouse, he came to me and said, Mrs. Boyne, I'm so sad I didn't get to take 
horticulture when we had the greenhouse. And so we, with a lot of persuasion, we convinced our guidance counselor to let him take horticulture again. And so in that horticulture class, we made the Tower Gardens his uh, special interest project. And he did a lot of work. Um, he did some experiments with them. He was in charge of um, basically the groups and what they were going to be planting. And so it was, it was kind of a really unique project for him. And that was good because Jacob um, is now a, a student studying horticulture at SDSU. And so it really gave him some, um, like an individual project for him where he could kind of explore his interest. Being able to say I ordered 3,000 worms on the internet today really raised some student interest. <laughs> if you said that in the hallway, the kids all wanted to know why you had worms in your room. And that, that, was, that was really a, an interest point for a lot of my students. Um, when they found out I had 3,000 worms in my room, and 3,000 worms actually does, doesn't take up a whole lot of space, um, but they thought that was pretty cool from, you know, kids that even weren't in my ag classes wanted to know where the worms were and what we were doing with them. And I had a lot of uh, boys that, you know, wanted to know, could they, can I buy it for fishing bait? <laughs> <coughs> so that was really fun and kind of a success story of it, is it piqued student interest because then we could use that to start to talk about um, what, why we bought these tower gardens and what they can teach us and what they can teach us about sustainability. Uh, students learn to be innovative and experiment. So here again, I have a picture of the students putting together the towers and they worked in, they worked in partners and each pair got a tower to put together. Um, and so the students had to learn how things go together. Can, can we do this without reading the instructions or do we need to read the instructions? What kind of tools do we need? Um, and so I thought that was really interesting to see the students work hands-on and try to problem solve. Um, you know, they're trying to look at each other, trying to see what the other group was doing. Um, and I thought that was really exciting. And then also just innovating when, we're, when it's coming to planting. I let the students choose the plants. Um, they chose where to plant them, if they wanted to start them directly in the tower or if they wanted to start them as a seed separately. Um, and I think today we don't let kids play enough, and this was a good opportunity to let them play around and really um, have some interest in it. They're aesthetically pleasing. They just look nice. We can put out, we can roll them outside our greenhouse when it's nice out, um, and that's, again, kind of gets people looking like, huh, what are those? And it gives us a good conversation to start. We had several visitors get to experience our towers and learn about sustainable agriculture, so that was also neat. Um, uh, since our students had some stake in it, since they were the ones in charge of it, they had their tower that they were growing and they wanted to make sure theirs was growing better than everyone else's. They liked to talk about them. Uh, we had the Na National Watershed Coalition come. We had National Association for Con Conservation Agencies come. Uh, the Nemaha County Leadership classes visited. And we had seventh grade science classes come and visit um, when they were learning about growing plants. So it, it was a neat opportunity and gives us um, a really f a physical thing for kids to talk about, you know, we can talk about sustainable agriculture all we want to students, but until they can see something, it doesn't really hit home with them. And so this was a really good opportunity there. Although we had a lot of successes, we had a lot of challenges too, and we're still kind of going through some of those challenges. Um, so we struggled keeping the worms alive a lot. We've ordered three different batches of worms now. Um, the first ones we got, we um, so this is, this is Jacob in this picture, and he just took control. I, I said, Jacob, we're getting these worms, figure out what we need to do. Um, well, when it said to put soil in the, in the bins, we were keeping them in some rubber made totes until our uh, towers were ready. He just grabbed some topsoil from the greenhouse, um, and that doesn't hold water very well, and so our worms were constantly drying out and drying out. So we lost that batch of worms. So then I ordered a second batch of worms, and the second batch of worms came, and we opened it up, and they were in a frozen ball. Like, it was ice frozen, so they were already <laughs> doomed. Um, and I called the company, and they said, oh, we'll send you out some more real quick. And I was like, well, we should probably wait until it's warmer in Nebraska. And so that, that batch was already doomed. We got a third batch. Things have been going really great. I, you know, they stayed alive. Um, when we got them, we were just going to put them into the towers in, in January, and I went on maternity leave, and I, I thought my middle school kids had it. They were, I thought they were doing good. They stayed alive for a while, but they started, wa whenever they put moisture on the worms, they just sprayed the top of the worms and didn't actually get all the way through the soil. They just did it until it looked wet on top. 
Worms need a lot of moisture. They will dry out really fast. Um, when they start to dry out, they will crawl out of the bin. And so I went in one, one weekend, and there were, I don't, there were 3,000 worms we ordered. I don't know how many were dry on my floor, in my classroom, everywhere. So again, that's a good learning opportunity for students to talk about responsibility, talk about following instructions, talk about doing our research. Um, so we're going to order our fourth batch of worms here soon. Um, and hopefully maybe we'll keep this batch alive. They've progressively lived longer, so that's good. Um, you must compost the right foods. We learned about which foods you can compost. Um, again, Jacob, I let just take control. I, I really like my students to experience the positives and, and the failures. I think that that's important. Um, and so I let Jacob take this project, and this was his. And he went to the cafeteria, said, I need, you know, whatever food you're going to throw away, can I have it? I just let Jacob take it, you know, I, I didn't worry too much about it, and I went into the greenhouse uh, probably a couple days later, and it smelled so bad, and Jacob had got all of the broccoli and cauliflower from the cafeteria and put it in a Rubbermaid tote and put the lid on it in the, you know, 90-something degree greenhouse. It smelled terrible, <laughs> but it was a good opportunity again to talk about what foods we can compost, what foods we can't. Um, you know, talking about, oh, we don't put meat in them, we don't put dairy in them, we're not going to put broccoli and cauliflower in a closed container in 90 degree heat and wait a few days. That we dumped outside and it still smelled outside. So that's pretty good. But we got, to, it was a good talking point again. Uh, we did have some gnats. Um, again, that's related to composting the right foods and the right amount of foods. Um, making sure that you have the right amount of foods that your, that your worms can eat and get through all of that. Uh, we did have our center compost columns collapse a few times. So the, the center of them are, it's just plastic and they're not really held together. Um, so they did kind of collapse, um, which isn't a huge deal. You know, I talked with the Tower Garden people, they have a support group on Facebook too. And they said, well, that's not a, a big deal. Like worms can usually get to where they want to be, where they need to be. Um, but this is also a, a good problem to have because my students the second time this is our second time putting the towers back together. We took them all out and cleaned them out. Um, now they're figuring out ways that we can try to make that column more sturdy, um, using wire and things to, to hold it a little bit more sturdy. Uh, we're still trying to figure out the best watering method as well, which is again a good experience I had. We still don't know where this stuff came from, but some, some watering systems appeared in our greenhouse over the summer. Somebody must have dropped off some totes, thought we needed some watering system. And that's really cool because my students are learning to put that together. They're watering halos. Um, that connect eventually to the host system. And so they're working on putting that together and seeing if a tower with that system is going to be better than our system where we just water with a hose. Um, and the nice thing about that, um, a lot of times we um, are going to start using just our rainwater instead of the hose and um, filling, filling buckets from our rainwater system and putting them into this, uh, the towers. As far as future plans, um, towers will be reconstructed by February. We have one more tower to put together. Um, I have just a small group of students working on that while some other, work, some other students work on other things in the greenhouse. And we're dividing them into teams to research and develop a management, problems, or management plan for the greenhouse. So uh, the students, I have five towers. There'll be about two to three students on each tower. I'm going to divide those. Um, and they're going to figure out a method for collecting the browns. So the cardboard, the grass clippings, things like that that the worms need um, for their carbon. Um, method for collecting greens and the list of appropriate food scraps. So how are we going to collect those? Are we going to ask individual students at lunch to say whatever they're going to throw away? Are we going to ask the cafeteria? Are students going to bring stuff from home? And then, again, what would be appropriate? Probably not broccoli, probably not cauliflower. Um, it's a good opportunity to talk about how a lot of fruits will in, um, increase your fruit fly. Uh, population and gnats in your tower as well. Uh, the students will have a worm feeding schedule and a management plan. So rather than putting all 3,000 worms in one or in a, a couple of totes, we're going to divide them. You're in charge of your worms. You're in charge of your worms. You're in charge of your worms. Um, so that hopefully students can um, take some more stake in in this project and realize that they're keeping, you know, they're in charge of these worms. Are you going to be able to keep it alive? Because this group over here is their worms are doing great. How can you compete with that? And then a planting map and a schedule. Um, so they'll pick which plants they want to grow, when they want to plant them, 
um, when approximately we're going to be harvesting. And then as well as a watering schedule, since that was one of the problems we've had is figuring out the watering schedule. Um, we were either overwatering and growing, we were getting um, a yellow fungus to grow, or we were underwatering and everything was drying out, so figuring out what the best way to water is. And then students will hopefully be able to useful, utilize the towers from the Nebraska FBA Agri-Science Fair. Um, there's an Agri-Science Fair held every year in April at, in Lincoln um, with our State FFA convention, so hopefully once we get these towers going, students will be able to complete experiments on them for the following school year. And then science classes, we will learn about the towers on visits to the greenhouse. So we're working on um, trying to get the science classes at Auburn to utilize the towers, the greenhouse, the aquaponics, the rain barrels as well. Um, we've had a, f a few things that have come in from the science classes, but hoping to um, let those students also experience it. Not every student can take an agricultural class. Um, at Auburn, if you're in choir and band, it's really difficult to be enrolled in an agriculture class. So hopefully, um, by encouraging the science classes to get involved, we can also get those students involved and interested in sustainable agriculture and what we can be doing um, even if you don't live on a farm. Um, the, the next session kind of goes into grant writing and so I wanted to talk a little bit about our grant writing process and some things that I have been able to um, learn through grant writing. Uh, all of the things we went through at the very beginning were grant funded um, either from grants written by me, grants written by my administration, our curriculum director, our superintendent. So in terms of the grant writing process, it's important to read the entire grant and ensure your product fits the grant and the goals of the grant. So you, it's a lot easier if you're looking for grants and you're thinking, what, what do I need that would fit the goal? Um, for me, I keep a list of things as I go to conferences, as I go to conventions, that I think are really neat and really cool, and I just keep a list of those all the time. I have an Excel document, I just write down things that if I ever have an unlimited budget, these are the things that I want for my agricultural program. Then as I come across grants, um, Gary's been really helpful with that because he works in our county and so he's been able to really remind me of when these grants are due, grants that are upcoming, and how any projects that I have could fit the goal of that grant. Create a detailed budget. Um, I think that this is really important. I've helped other ag teachers write grants and a lot of times they just say, well, I want $2,000 to have a sustainable ag project. You need to be consistent about what you're going to do and very detailed about what your budget's going to be. You could see in the budget that I put on the screen earlier, I had a budget for Ziploc bags so that we had somewhere to put the lettuce once they was grown so we could send it home with the students. I had a budget for seeds. I had a budget for, you know, I included the shipping cost. The more detailed your budget can be, the grant um, committee is going to look at that and think, okay, they actually do have a plan for where this is money is going and it's not going to be wasted. Include quantities, amounts, tax shipping, as I said. Um, consult with an expert or the company. Um, one of the, uh, the tower garden people, they really helped me come, or sorry, those were garden towers. The garden tower people helped me come up with a budget as well. You know, I said, this is what I want. I want five of these towers. What other things do I need? Um, can you help me come up with that budget? Utilize all of the funds. It's important that you're going to utilize the funds that are given and that grant committee knows exactly what's going to be purchased with those funds. Make sure you create smart goals. So there you have quantities, um, amounts, tax, shipping, things like that. You're consulting with the company. Again, what are some goals that I could have? Um, an example of this, we had a really lofty goal of producing um, a lot of tomatoes, cucumbers, things like that, while well, not realizing how difficult a hand pollination on a cucumber was. It, if anybody's really good at that, I'd love to hear about it because it took us forever to try to get any cucumbers to be pollinated. Um, and so our goal in the grant was to produce X number of pounds of vegetables, and we learned very quickly that we couldn't produce cucumbers, tomatoes, eggplant, things like that and our lettuce and kale didn't weigh as much. So we didn't get to that goal, but we had a goal in mind at least. And then utilize your funds for those goals. Um, ensure that the project or outreach is or a continuation plan. Um, this is a good example. My husband also applied for a SARE grant um, one year. Uh, the same year I planned, applied for one. His was on the farmer side, mine was on the educator side. Um, and then we, we found out that I got a grant and my husband's grant got denied. I thought that was pretty funny, but <laughs> come to find out he had 
he didn't write anything in the grant about project outreach, project continuation. How is he going to tell people about the things he learned through this grant? And that's a really important thing, whether you're writing a grant for Sarah or writing a grant for another company. Um, letting that grant company or committee know these are the ways that you're going to get your ideas out. My husband's not the kind of guy that wants to go to conventions and talk or really talk to many people at all. He doesn't want to write news articles. He doesn't want to post it on social media. He just wants to do his farming and be done with it. Well, again, I told him, I said, if you would have said, you know, how are, how are you going to tell people about this, have a field day at your house, probably have a better chance of getting it. So some things to do that, writing news articles or uh, journal articles, any social media that you can get it. So if your farm has a social media page, you know, talking about this was funded through this grant is always helpful. Um, public events, um, so we wanted to go to the Home and Garden Show. That didn't end up working, but we did host the people from the Watershed Coalition and the Conservation Agency. Um, those are really helpful. So if you have like a Home and Garden Show in your area or a, a conference that you can be at, that's going to be beneficial. And then brochures, flyers, posters, um, that was something that I, it's nice for me because I have the opportunity to have, you know, I have 13 kids in horticulture right now, 13 kids in horticulture, your job is to create these because then they're learning through that. Or if you're not a teacher, you're going to have to create those on your own. But um, it is a good opportunity to not only get your business name out, but to get out um, the, the grant um, funding committee is really nice to do some promotion on their behalf as well. And then always creating the curriculum or lessons. So we did some lessons on um, vermiculture and raising worms, and I could do that with uh, not only my horticulture kids, but my eighth grade agriculture kids as well, um, which is beneficial. So um, as producers, any curriculum or any lessons that you can do um, is going to be really beneficial, not only to the grant committee that oversees that, but also to teachers. Um, speaking for a teacher myself, I am always wanting uh, guest speakers or farm tours. So if you have a grant and you can get an agriculture class to come out to your farm to tour it or get a science class to come out and tour it, I know that the that a lot of teachers would be more than happy to be able to come out and see the things on your farm as well. So that's a great way to get that, that project outreach. I think, um, I think June said about 2.10, and I think I'm right on spot. So um, if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those questions as well. Okay, so the question was, um, do teachers at Auburn get any like um, benefits from writing grants? And I haven't seen any of those benefits, I guess. Um, at this, it kind of started, my grant writing frenzy kind of started when um, Auburn got a revision grant, which is our grant through the Nebraska Department of Education to start an agriculture program. So my salary was grant funded my first year. Um, so that's how they were able to justify starting an agriculture education program. They had one in the 70s, I believe, um, and it just kind of faded away. Um, but I do think that that is a really great idea because I started writing grants and it kind of got to be contagious. I was really excited for all the things that I was getting from my classroom. Um, but there was a time when I had to take a step back and stop because you, you think that all the, the work is up front when actually the grant, writing the grant is actually not that hard. It's all of the follow-up paperwork um, and things that you have to do to follow up, you know, making sure you're sending in your receipts especially if you're through a school because we have to go through another accountant to, to order everything. And so it's not just me, you know, I get sent the grant check and then I just order stuff on my credit card and I get reimbursed there. It all goes through another system. Um, and so I, I, if you have a, a local school where you have a say, I think that that is a, a great idea to encourage teachers um, because it's, it's quite a bit of time that I spend doing the paperwork and all the reporting from those grants. Um, from this grant, um, yeah, this was a $2,000 grant. What have you noticed um, for a difference in the kids after the project? So I think um, there's been several outcomes. First of all, my students have been a lot more aware of where their food comes from, um, and it's really cool to see um, our, our cafeteria, you know, just buys a lot of, like, our produce from um, the food, you know, from Cisco, things like that. And... The kids at school don't want to eat the salad bar, but when we put our produce on the salad bar, we try to put out a sign that says produced in the Auburn High School greenhouse, and kids are a lot more apt to eat it because they're like, oh, that was, that was the greens that we were growing on in the greenhouse, or I got to water those one day. 
And so we see a, a lot of kids becoming more interested in where their food comes from and wanting to um, eat the food that they grew. Um, and I, th I think that's really the biggest outcome we've had is the kids now knowing what process goes into growing their food and being more interested in eating the food that they produced. I think there's a, a, a couple of things. I think our greenhouse is too hot um, when we were trying to plant it because it would um, bolt right away and go to seed. Um, our seeds are also pretty old and so we just didn't really have very great germination rates. And the seeds that we got from Orchlands came through a student who kept them at his house for a while and so I don't think he probably kept them in the best environment either. Um, I bought a lot of purple crops to uh, like some purple lettuce, purple carrots, uh, some purple radishes. No, not at all, but it gets kids excited when they see purple lettuce. They think that's pretty cool. We planted some purple basil. So just, I, I try to plant really weird, unique things to get students excited and wondering what, why is there purple lettuce on the cafeteria.